Great again. This is a Lunch and Learn with Littman Crooks. I'm Marion Walsh. I'm a partner at Littman Crooks and I lead the special education department. So um, we're having a few more people come on and I will be taking questions if you want to put your video on and raise your hand or if you put it in the chat. Okay, because I will be, I think it's really great to have an interactive presentation to the extent possible. Okay. So I know a few more people are connecting. I see Alana on there. She's trying to get on. And um, Alana and everyone else, I just asked if you wanted to put your video on and ask questions or make comments, that would be great. We're again talking about making hybrid and remote instruction work in these challenging times. So, um, so I'll go ahead and get started. And just so everyone knows this session is recorded just in case you do decide to ask questions. So um, just to give you some of my background, I'm, been, I'm an attorney, I've been an attorney for over 30 years now and a partner at Littman Crooks, had been there for almost nine years heading the special education department. And um, we have you know, over 200 cases in various stages and every kind of challenge and disability you can imagine from New York City all the way up to the Duchess and um, you know, it's a very busy, challenging time. And this was probably, I would say, the most difficult year I've seen in special education advocacy, uh, largely, yeah, obviously, because of the pandemic and the remote learning and just the repercussions. And because the benchmark is low for all students, you know, the benchmark has changed for every student. Um, but we do have to remember that it's now been a year, almost a year, well, March 20th, 20, 22nd is when New York State shut down and March 16th is when my colleague Amy just dying as well. March 16th is when most of the schools shut down or so. So we've been doing this almost a year now. So school districts should be getting better at it. And I know a lot of districts are somewhat um, in person, either totally or have a hybrid. So, um, but still the, the job here and what we're gonna be talking about right now is to how to make sure this hybrid or remote learning is working for your child. And school districts, it's not necessarily what they're going to be doing proactively. It's gonna be what <clears throat> really parents have to push because um, I'll explain why that is. Um, so um, Amanda, nice to see you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Amanda's a um, student at Cardoza and I know um, you messaged me on LinkedIn, so great to see you. Um, and I see my colleague, Amy Halpert is here as well. Amy has done some great work. So he's of counsel to our firm with um, how to really keep data for your child. That's gonna be some of the first things I talk about. Oops, there's Alana, just had trouble getting on again. I'm just so, um, so just a reminder, just to give us the sense of where we are. Um, as I said, we've been in this pandemic now for almost a year in March. And um, we really first have to remind ourselves that, you know, Take a deep breath and everyone really realize we're lucky to be here having this conversation right now. It's been a terrible year for, in many respects. Um, and we're just, for those who are healthy and have health and our children are healthy, that's the most important thing. However, of course, that doesn't excuse uh, the student not making appropriate progress. And a reminder that the Department of Education and New York State Education Department have both stated that because even despite the pandemic that children are still, a, entitled to a free appropriate public education. And that means an IEP must be reasonably calculated to produce educational benefit based on the student's unique needs and circumstances. It's the student's unique needs and circumstances, not um, the district's unique needs and circumstances. So just remember that. And um, progress means passing grade to grade, proficiency improvement on state assessments to the extent they're offered, they're not offered right now, but there should be some assessment. Um, IEP goals, progress on IEP goals, improvement in academic levels, improvement in physical social management needs, and as well as, of course, progress of in social emotional needs and well being. And that's been one of the most difficult parts of this pandemic is addressing student mental health needs with the isolation. Um, and again, the Department of Education and the state have both said that districts are not relieved of the obligation to provide FAPE. And in fact, in the reopening guidance, New York State has stated that districts must ensure to the greatest extent possible that each student with a disability is getting the special education and IEP services load in the IEP. 
So, um, and you know, it, 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 the state though has recognized that during this emergency, schools may not be able to provide the services in the same manner they are typically provided, but it does have to work. And that's what part of your job is <clears throat> at parents, that we have the reminder of the um, state obligation and how should you, what it, so we, you have to think about what are your child's needs and challenges in the remote hybrid environment? Because there's been a lot of guidance and discussion about what districts have to do with their remote learning plans. A lot of, obviously, as I said, statements that students need a free appropriate public education, but there's been very little focus on how to develop that remote or hybrid instruction plan. And I'm gonna call it a virtual instruction plan or because um, I didn't want to call it a remote instruction plan because the, the acronym. So I'm calling it a virtual VIP, virtual instruction plan. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. And I'm going to be talking about the process to help develop that because the school district is not going to initiate that. I will tell you they're overwhelmed with just too many things. Um, but so it's really going to be up to the parent to advocate for this. And, I'm, and, um, and then I'm going to tell you kind of some of the steps to get there. I'm not gonna be able to give anyone individual advice on your particular child at this point, because um, this is just an informational lunch and learn, but um, I do wanna give you sort of the process. Um, and remember, of course, IEPs have to meet the students' unique needs and circumstances. And you know, also districts just were not equipped for this pandemic or remote learning when it happened in March. But by now, they, they should be. You know, I know everyone's still overwhelmed, but there should be a better plan for each child. Um, districts have their own plan, but each child does need to have their own plan. And, and it, it's just sometimes the way this is set up, it's almost set for so many difficulties because teachers, when you're teaching a class, really cannot teach in-person and hybrid, in-person in and remote simultaneously. The remote instruction requires its own methodology, own way of teaching. And the best, you know, ideally there would be a remote teacher and a, <clears throat> and an in-person teacher uh, in each class. That just can't happen with resources. I know my sister teaches in a private Catholic school and she's able to um, have a remote person just do her, the students who are remote, which would be the, <clears throat> probably the appropriate way to do this. So, um, so that's just some of the background and introduction. I see everyone doesn't have the video on. If anyone has questions, you can unmute and, um, and make it a little more interactive, but um, but I'll just keep going if not, okay? So, so some of the steps that we're working with, that I'm gonna be talking about, ideally you're gonna work with your school district collaboratively to develop these steps. But as I stated, parents are gonna to need to take the initiative in a lot of these. So I'm gonna be talking, first of all, about the first step in any kind of re <clears throat> virtual instruction plan is to be looking at the student needs, your, your child's needs in the remote environment. And you're going to really need to have data on what is and what is not working, either in the hybrid or the or the remote or even in person because the student is not likely to be in person all the time. Um, and if they are in person, it might look different than it does during regular um, during our non pandemic times. Um, so looking at how we collect data, we're looking at First of all, the district does have its own data. It has report cards. There are attendance records. There will be evaluations if your child needs more updated evaluations. It's a good idea to, to ask for them. You, as a parent, there's an IEP. You, you should know the IEP. Review it inside and out and make sure you study it because that's going to be part of what the, what the child's needs are. And I don't know how badly it's, it's okay. It's okay. Oh, I'm just going to mute you, Amy, if you're, <laughs> unless you do. Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, so again, looking at the data the district has, we have the services reports. We have, look at the last IEP on levels of achievement. Look at IEP progress reports. Students' classwork. Um, you can also observe the student if they're in remote environment, that you, something you can't do when the student is in class generally. And you're going to also be looking at how your student is doing social emotionally. And we have a whole other presentation on how to keep this data, but I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. Um, again, you should study the IEP, make sure you know what the district has as the baseline, make sure it's accurate. And then when your student, when your child is working at home or what you see in the hybrid environment, you should be keeping some data on this. Okay. Um, so 
once you have a sense of how your child is doing, what some of the challenges of the student are in the remote environment, this should be documented, um, both that you do it and then to convince the district to have it also. And districts are not doing this. They're doing it a little bit better now. I mean, they're doing it more appropriately now, but initially at the beginning of the pandemic, the districts would sort of say, well, we're not going to be um, amending the IEP based on the pandemic. We're going to be just really looking at um, when the child, if, just if we did not have a pandemic, which is sort of absurd because of course that's not the reality. And that's not in conformance with what the law states, what the guidance states or what is appropriate for any child. And ideally, you know, districts really should have um, at the time of the shutdown, um, you know, kind of assessed each child for what, how, what, what their unique learning needs would be in a remote or virtual or hybrid environment. However, that generally did not happen. And this wasn't a global emergency. So districts were completely overwhelmed, caught off guard like we all are. So we understand that that did not happen. However, as I stated, now it really should be happening. And you know, even the guidance from New York State, from the, I'm sorry, from the United States Department of Education does specifically say that school districts should develop or may develop distant learning, distance learning plans um, for students. And really what some of that, some of the guidance was very general. It just meant that they should have a plan for delivering distance learning. However, we all know that the, the plan has to be individualized. If a, you know, there's so many needs, students have needs, and many students just simply cannot access the remote environment at all. And in that case, this district should be making some accommodations to figure out how they can, how they can access it, if it's all possible, or whether there can be some means for in-person instruction. So, so you're not, I'm not a clinician, you're not a, most of you, I don't think here are clinicians. So we are not going to be Doing a psycho, doing psychoeducational evaluations on our children, but we can be, we can have a sense based on the data we do have on what the child's needs are in the remote environment. And just a practical tip: when you are documenting this to the school district in writing, not just in phone calls, because if it doesn't happen, if it doesn't happen if it's not in writing. Don't don't think a phone call is enough. Don't think a conversation is enough. Don't don't think a Zoom. A conference is enough unless you're actually recording it, which you, you can do. I'm not suggesting you do, but you, you can do. Um, I would tell the person that you're recording it. And but on the other hand, if it's not in writing, the district is not going. It doesn't happen. Didn't happen. And it's very important to have it in email or a letter. Email is the best way to communicate right now. So when you have many of you may have um, IEP meetings, CSC meetings coming up, and at that point. It's going to be an annual review um, in all likelihood. And if you don't have a program review set up, ask that, at, ask that that annual review also be a program review because it's not going to happen automatically. And if the district is meeting, say, in February to develop the IEP for either July or September in 21 to 22, the 21 22 school year, um, that IEP will take effect in either July or in September. And the changes will not be in effect right now, but students need changes right now in their IEPs to make sure they can make progress for the rest of the year. So if the district doesn't notice a program review, when you get the, that annual review notice to say, I need this to be a program review because these things are not working right now. And I would venture to say that everyone here whose student is in a remote or hybrid environment, there is something that's not working <laughs> because it's a, extremely challenging for almost every student. I, there are a few, you know, students I worked with who are actually thriving in the remote environment, but they are few and far between. <laughs> you know, and um, and if any of the your parents of college students, it's really going to be up to the college student to do this advocacy. But you can um, give some tools to your student who's in college to help them make sure that they are also accessing the remote environment um, and that they kind of know what is working and what's not working. Um, so um, so just to kind of go through and deciding, you know, what, what, what should you expect from the district and deciding whether to provide a child special education services remotely, a district should address, they should be addressing um, how delivering this instruction will enable the student to receive free appropriate public education. And one way, just there's a few ways to do this, but the first thing is to make sure that it is documented 
in the IEP. And I had recommended a virtual instruction program as noted that there should be kind of distance learning plan. And this can be a separate plan or part of the IEP, or it can be in the IEP. And where it would go in the IEP, it would be if you're looking at an I, a basic IEP but after the comment section and after the evaluations, there's a section on present levels of performance. It's technically called academic achievement, functional performance, and learning characteristics. And either interspersed with that or as a separate section, there should be a section, if it's not a separate, uh, separate, sec separate plan, on how the students, hi Donna, um, how the students, what the student needs in the virtual environment or in the hybrid environment and what the students, and that's where your documentation will come in and what the student struggles are. Because the district is generally not gonna do this on its own to document this. So it's, it's important that that be listed there and it has to be individualized. And by now, after, since, since, after all this time since March, districts do have enough data and you have enough data to make sure that that is part of that. You know, so for example, if the, um, if the student's IEP does not include this, then that's something you should definitely ask for. And if you don't ask that this to be a program review as well, the district might say, the CSE may just say, well, we're really planning for 21, 22 in September, we anticipate it will be fully in person by then. First of all, we don't know that. And second, you still have to get to that point. And also you have to, there is some lag and some misservices, which we can also discuss a little bit, a little bit later on how to, how to ask for that. Okay. So, um, so every student's needs are different, obviously in the learning environment. And even if a student's needs aren't necessarily apparent um, and the district may not even know about them, there are almost certainly either executive functioning issues, some social emotional issues due to isolation, as well as you know, other needs, such as just um, how learning not to procrastinate. Every, even typical students will have, have that issue in a, in, in a completely remote environment. It's much more difficult to handle time. In fact, the Wall Street Journal just had a good article out on um, procrastination and even for adults on how to, how to manage time during a pandemic. Um, and my son, who, my son, for example, in college was saying to me that it's so, the year, the semester he was remote, he found it so hard to manage time because it'd be misleading. There wouldn't be the regularity of classes. And then all of a sudden at the end of the semester, there would be, you know, five papers to write, <laughs> you know, and that's gonna, that's also happens in the high school environment and for students who are progressing in the, in the general curriculum, general education curriculum. And it's going to happen with every student, um, you know, so, so even if it's not apparent to the child, there are going to be <clears throat> needs that need to be addressed. Okay. So, um, so this virtual instruction plan, you can do it as part of the IEP, and in every domain, um, every you know, every IEP should list how to address students' needs. So, if your student has speech language services, you should address how um, what the individual needs are in the remote learning environment. If the student has OT, um, it's going to be almost impossible, I would, to deliver OT um, virtually. And I think that's been pretty documented. Just giving a sheet is not enough. Um, and that's what's happened, unfortunately, in some cases. So there has to be a way that the student can get OT. And if the district can't do it at this time, then there should be a plan for some analysis of what makeup services or compensatory services are needed. Um, the same as services such as PT. If counseling is given in the remote environment, how what are the students' needs in that area? So there should be the remote instruction plan should cover every area of service, every in need, and how the remote how the um, remote environment impacts that. And the goal here is really to close the gap. So we have a there is a gap between what the student where the student would be in the regular education environment if there were no pandemic, and where the student is now, which is maybe here. And you know, it, there is a gap for every student, not, and typical students as well. Yet we're, we're, we're talking right now about students with disabilities and the gap is almost always greater because um, students with disabilities, there's been shown, there's been a disproportionate impact um, with the pandemic, particularly with those lost services, such as OT, PT, um, which really are almost very hard to give um, virtually. Um, I would say impossible, but there may be some certain instances. Okay. So, um, so just some examples of what you could list, um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a continuum of what you would list in 
on the student virtual instruction plan. Yeah, it could be that the student needs direct instruction and cannot access remote learning. If that's true, how can the district, can the district serve this student in person? Um, there's been, that's a complicated question because um, districts are not mandated if there's no, if there's a public health and safety emergency to serve students in person. However, they can do so to the maximum extent possible under applicable health and safety guidelines. And more and more districts are bringing in the students with the most significant disabilities who cannot learn as well virtually for in-person instruction. Um, there's some case law on this. There was one case, LVV, New York City Department of Education. It was from July, 2020. And in that case, a parent did bring a suit against New York City, just saying, my child cannot access this remote learning environment. What can, and <clears throat> I need to mandate, I need an injunction to, it's an order to mandate um, in-person instructions. And the, the fact that particular court did order based on a magistrate report that the student should receive um, direct instruction to the extent possible as under health and safety guidelines. And also asked that if the district couldn't do it, couldn't do it um, in person, then they should look for some in-person providers who could privately. And that some districts will agree to that, some won't, but more and more, I think you can ask for direct instruction if, it's, if the remote is really not working for your child. And the other thing that that court ordered is to have um, an assistive technology evaluation. Now districts have been giving students assistive technology, Chromebooks and, you know, but there, there has to be assistive technology that actually works. There has to be an individualized plan for the assistive technology. You can't just throw a student an, I, an iPad or a Chromebook and say, okay, here you have this now, <laughs> that's enough. Um, so there really has to be an individual plan and assistive technology evaluation really should be done on some level for every student. I know that districts will not do that and it's not exactly feasible, but there should be some kind of way to ensure that the student does have a way to, um, to access assistive to access, to make sure you're actually doing it method, method, <laughs> doing it thoroughly to make sure you understand the student's needs. And some of that is gonna be assistive technology. Um, so, and generally school districts don't conduct their own assistive technology evaluations. They have to find another group such as BOCES to do it. So it is gonna take some time to get that done. Yet, I think you could ask for at least an analysis from the providers on what, um, what the student needs and how to document it if they can't do a full assistive technology evaluation. Um, so, um, so that's, that's some of the basics. I'm just noting when some of the, what, what, the, um, what that remote instruction plan could look like. Um, the student may need a one-to-one -one person virtually with him or her to access remote learning. And the, the role of aides in, um, in this pandemic has been difficult to discern because an aide really does have to be supervised by a teacher and does not provide instruction. But a TA can provide instruction or a class TA could individualize instruction for a student or could help to direct what students are doing remotely. Um, the student may need prompting, assistance with the schedule. The student may need redirection. These are just some examples. Um, the student may need synchronous learning, may, maybe, or may need asynchronous learning. Um, and the student, or the student may need breaking down long assignments and a plan for executive functioning. Um, and really the goals for, should be measured in the remote environment. I think one comment, one, there's one question we had from a parent which came up. <clears throat> and the question was, I just have to locate it here, was, <clears throat> noting that um, you'd like to touch upon adding remote hybrid goals to 20, 21 to 22 IEPs. She was finding that 2021 IEP goals are relying on being in the classroom. That's hard to adapt them in this situation. Now, I would agree with that. And I would also say they should be done in this IEP, not necessarily for 21, 22, because I do anticipate, you know, nobody knows what's gonna happen in the fall, if there's going to be enough vaccines that students can come back full time or not. It seems unlikely. It seems like there will still be a hybrid um, environment, but I can't predict that. Um, but I do think even if the goals are not changed, certainly the methodology of how to review the goals should be documented in, I'm just giving, gonna give an example. So um, suppose the student has to, solve a two-step word problem that requires addition and subtraction. 
and verbally identifying the operation needed in sequence. That's going to be done. That's really a special education teacher goal. And that can be done in the, in the remote environment, depending on the, um, the classroom setting, whether it's if it's an ICT class, it could be done by the special education teacher. But that is going to require some individualized attention. So it won't be, it's, it's going to have to be, so there's going to have to be not just under the method, it wouldn't just be um, under test and worksheets. There should be a way that should be done specifically in the remote environment. So perhaps the student has a separate study session, a st separate session to review that with the teacher after the classroom. It's not going to be able to be done in the remote classroom because it's different. You know, it, it's going to depend on how the school has set it up, but it's going to be difficult for the special education teacher in that classroom to really make sure that student is making progress on that goal. Um, so really, it's going to be looking at the methodology with that. Um, so, um, so another question that came up was um, basically a question for how to make remote or hybrid learning work. You need to communicate clearly with teachers about the importance of providing accessible materials, legible and printable aids, such as graphic organizers, rubrics, and math charts. And this person noted that too often students are just getting JPEGs of reading or anchor charts or minimized PDFs, which are hard to read for visually impaired students or students with learning disabilities. And most of these accommodations are in the IEP. So how can I make, make sure this happens for my child? And that's, that's an excellent question. And it's going to take and what I, the, the process that I just went through on making sure you document that what this district is not doing is, is doing now is not working. And what the students needs are is documented by all the evaluations and supports and then writing a letter and documenting what the students why you need this and having a discussion at the next IEP meeting, which really should be a um, which should be a program review as well. I had another question come up. Any success precedent on FBAs or BIPs in the remote environment? So the question is, um, what, have, what have I seen as far as utilizing functional behavior assessments or and then the behavior intervention plans in the remote environment? And that's a that's been very difficult and one of the most difficult areas we've seen. Because especially in the remote environment, the parent, because parent is at home with the child, is the one who's going to be making sure the child, first of all, gets to the computer, is accessing school. And then some behaviors are such as avoidance behaviors are going to be very difficult for the parent to manage. So I have seen the way I have seen some um, FBAs done in the remote environment by just documenting what the students needs are or students' behaviors are in the remote environment. Um, and it really is going to be very dependent on the student. I haven't seen it work well for really any students yet, but there is time. <laughs> so, um, but I do think that's the parent participation, even though parents we know are overwhelmed and um, it's a, you know, it's hard to do this, but keeping track of the data is important, you know, because the district is not going to see that if the child is just not at the um, at the computer. That's an avoidant behavior, but the district will not be able to assess what the cause is or what the um, reasons are, and it's going to have to be done differently. So you would have to document my student, my my child was not able to get to the computer today. They he had a tantrum and threw himself on the floor. We knock it on the computer and document it, and then send it to the district. And if parents can keep track of that behavior, it will then give the district more information and you can have an ideally a provider a behaviorist then look at all the data and be able to figure out a plan to talk to the student again if the student can't access the remote environment it's going to be very difficult it's going to have to be done more when the student is in person but um but i haven't seen a lot of success with this right now i don't have there there <clears throat> there is a lot of need, there's certainly a lot of need and there's certainly um a lot of hope for the future, but right now it, I haven't seen it yet. Um, so um, another thing just to touch on, let me just, there's another question here. Um, okay, I think that was, um, student mental health needs are, you know, really there, there was a crisis before the pandemic with student mental health needs and um, students having, you know, just one in five students, for example, having a mental health condition by the time they, um, this one, one statistic um, during their school, um, during the time they're in school. And during the pandemic, obviously the isolation is even worse. And, um, 
and it's difficult also to get the services needed. So it's very important to give the school any data you have on your child's mental health needs. If you're concerned about a crisis, you know, of course, the first thing to do would call, be, you know, if you're concerned about a major crisis and a health and safety issue, obviously um, call 911. But to the extent that's not the case, if you're just very concerned for the future, it is important to involve the school district in these conversations to make sure the student has counseling, make sure the counseling is actually working for the student to the extent it can virtually if the student needs to go in in person, um, ask for the student to be able to go in. Again, um, the districts, there's no specific mandate for the districts to serve students in person in a health and safety emergency. However, to the extent they can and are able to, they should be able to certain, serve some students, prioritize students who really need their um, in-person services. And students with mental health needs who can get to school should be part of that group as well. Um, although one of the, <clears throat> Sometimes one of the um, needs and symptoms of a student with mental health conditions is they will be more isolated and will not wish to access the um, in-person environment. Um, so, so the remote or the virtual instruction plan is gonna have to be individualized for each child. It's gonna have to take a lot of work and time and for both parents and districts and working together on the student's needs. So I don't have any specific plan or template I'm going to be providing now, but I did give you sort of a process um, and to ensure that you keep doing this and you really have to be in this environment a persistent advocate because everyone is overwhelmed right now, even though we have been doing it for you know almost a year. And I think the fact that it's been almost a year is actually wearing also. Um, so, you know, it's um, even though it should be better at it, it's just people are also very tired <laughs> of it. So, but it's important to keep up that um, momentum and keep up that energy of advocacy and and you know also the um it's important also just to also be able to take a breath and realize that you know every child general education to the most significant special education needs is going to be struggling with this and we're going to have to have a time <clears throat> excuse me when schools are fully reopened to really assess what makeup services need to be done but it's most important really to focus not so much you, you need to focus on the academics but you also need to focus on the well-being of your child right now in this time and to make sure you get through the school year somewhat successfully. And the success mark is gonna look different um, no matter what. I'm not to dismiss or say this child is not, your child is not entitled to free appropriate public education, but it's important also just to be in the moment, just think, focus on the positives and teach your child the skills of resilience. And there's a lot of really good worksheets on really on everything, but also just on mental health needs and staying positive and resilience that are good to work at. I think there's um, Andrew Ecker at, Putnam Northern Western BOCES sends out a mental health sort of newsletter each month. There's some good resources there. Um, and there's, a, there's so much out there, Child Mind Institute. There's a lot of good resources, resources out there. So if you have any questions, you can email, um, email us for any information you're looking for in that area or in any other area. And if you, you know, if you need help with further help with trying to develop this instruction plan, you can always just you know, write us a note. Um, we have a question, another question. Is there a way for the IEP to address the transition back to in-person learning from the 100% remote? Yes, that should 100% be in the IEP. And any, any needs you see for your child should be in the IEP. And I think that's important to note that you have, if you, you know, when you look at, this, look at the IEP, look at the student's present levels of performance. If they're not accurate, if they don't reflect your child's needs, if there's something not in there that should be in, you can ask to put it in. If the district doesn't, if insists they're not going to put it in, that they, they don't agree, and you say, well, I want it from my perspective as a parent, then please put in the parent believes this. And, um, and then if they don't do it, then you can write a letter and ask, I need this to please be appended to the IEP. I'm in disagreement. I think this and this and this should be included. And, um, and yes, 100% districts should um, include transition needs. Not I don't mean transition to adulthood. That's a whole other section, but transition from any learning environment to another. In fact, there's been some case law that says, you know, not during your pandemic times, that when a student transitions from an elementary to a middle school, there should be some documentation of what the student needs for transition, if there are needs. And, um, and the same, if a student is moving 100, from 100% 100 remote to in-person, there should be a um, both a meeting, both first remotely, then in-person, and then a list of what the, how the student's needs are going to change because it is going to be an adjustment. I mean, if a student has trouble wearing masks, that should be difficult. That, that, that should be documented in their 
also, because the student will need some behavioral, some assistance with that. If a student won't get to, won't go to school, that's a whole other area. Um, and I would say that should be covered, should, it should first be covered in the um, areas, as we discussed, on present levels of performance, but then it should also be listed on in the accommodations um, section after the section on services. And that's where, after you list what the, um, what the present levels are, needs of the student, there should be a list of what the student's accommodations um, and modifications are. It should be listed there. Now, the districts may not, as I said, agree to this, but again, if you find this is true, you can, as a parent, you should document it and you know, work to be collaborative, but if there's not agreement, you need to document perspective in writing um, because then, and then in the future, if the child needs makeup services, you will have a record of what the student, what, what your requests were and what were not met. And if the child regressed, um, you know, what, what the needs are, okay, okay. So, um, so that gives you the basic process, I think. I'll take any other questions. Um, and then, you know, that, that's really what I was covering mostly today. And I just wanted to make sure, I hope all, all are well and, um, um, and stay well. <laughs> it's certainly a challenging time. <laughs> any questions or thoughts anyone has? There's one question, one comment. Thank you, okay, I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, we'll stay in touch and we will have, um, we have a newsletter that goes out every, um, every month at least or more often. And, um, and you know, if you have further questions, feel free to email us and we'll be happy to, um, to answer. Um, okay. And um, Joyce Hawk just pointed out there is some information from New York State, Gov um, New York State and NYSCD, the New York State Education Department um, on ed tech planning that you can also point out. Uh, one more question from Rosa. Okay, <laughs> she's writing it. <laughs> Bye, Amanda. Thank you for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay, take care. Sure. Okay, Rosa had a question. You can write it out, Rosa, or you can raise your hand and say it if you want. It's up to you. Um, if the hi, uh, my question oh. is. Um, if, a, if a skill was not acquired during hybrid or remote learning, like a certain like math or reading skill was not acquired, even with, you know, the offering of um, accommodations like learning lab, and then the class just moved on and the child didn't acquire the skill and in the area, the curriculum builds on that skill, what can be done to address that? Like, can I ask the school to backpedal and make sure the child acquires the skill in mathematics or reading or like, cause the, the child can't move forward and the child cannot access the curriculum because he or she has not acquired the skill. <laughs> yeah, that, that's an excellent question. And that does happen more often than not in the remote environment, unfortunately. So I think the first step is to document this, that the child, you know, did not acquire the skill. And then the first step with advocacy in a case like this would first be to talk to the teacher and note it, um, that my child cannot um, possibly do this word problem because they never learned this basic type of skill or this, um, or they can't multiply, whatever the, the particular issue is. They can't even multiply, now you're moving on to division. <laughs> um, or my child is, you know, can't, you know, there's, there's various levels. And, you know, some of the curriculum might circle back to that at some point, but at that point right now, your child can't learn this. So document that to the teacher again in writing. And then if it, if you don't get anywhere with that, then go to the CSE and just say, my child just needs to, to learn this skill. And you could even ask it be a goal. Now there's questions about goals because the school district, the CSE will say, well, it's a curricular issue, it's in curriculum, we're not going to list it as a goal because it's not a special education need. But it is a need for that child to learn that. So I think you could ask for some, if there's some, been some regression um, makeup services in this or ask for some specific tutoring in this area from the teacher or, you know, it would be, they don't call it tutoring from the district, they would call it compensatory to say I need, my child really just needs, um, missed these sessions, did not understand this and needs, could not access the remote environment and needs five hours of compensatory voted to this. And that's a reasonable amount. And I think this way you're asking for something, again, reasonable, and that will help everyone in the future if your child does get this. So, um, you know, and some parents, if they have the resources would decide that they would just provide their private tutors and then seek reimbursement or not. But I do think there are gonna be gaps and um, it's certainly 
we need to document it to the school district. Marion, can I just add one? A of comment? course, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, sorry, my, my technology is a little um, shoddy here. I also think it would it might be helpful to ask the teacher for a scope and sequence of skills that are being studied just in an effort to try to make your point you know, so that that skill that your child is, is missing is not looked at sort of in a vacuum, but in order to sort of say, well, here's the sequence of skills that my child needs to access. You can see that this is a cumulative um, program, you know, with one skill building upon the other. It might help, um, it might help for that um, plea for compensatory services in that particular area. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. And the New York State curriculum, general education curriculum through Next Generation is all online. You know, right. so in the general education curriculum, you can access and look at what your child should and shouldn't be learning. I know parents, you know, it's difficult to have time to do all of this, but <clears throat> really every child should be progressing in the general education curriculum, some with some modifications. But if you get a sense of what it is, you can kind of just see where your child is and isn't learning. Because some parents have complained to me, for example, that even though their child is passing grade to grade, the grades don't mean anything because they really haven't mastered those skills. That's a, you know, can be definitely an issue. So just keep an eye on that. And sometimes the district will say, no, they child did do this. But you know, if you have documentation that they didn't do it, then definitely share that. So thank you, Amy. That's a really good point. Okay. Well, thank you all. I hope you actually got to enjoy. I didn't get to, I'll have lunch after, but <laughs> but I hope everyone does stay well. And, um, you know, we're coming, we hope toward the end of this, but I don't see it, you know, certainly not for this year. We just don't know about um, the next year, but please stay in touch and let us know, let me know if you have any further questions, need more individualized um, advice. And um, I really appreciate you being, being here today. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, take care, everybody, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.